Good evening, everybody. It Good is evening. so wonderful to be here. We are in part two of the crash course through the Torah. And this is the five books in five weeks. And my hope is that we will stick to the schedule and that we'll be able to get through all the material. Um, Genesis in particular is a little bit more challenging than the other books of the Torah because it covers 2,000... 309 years uh, which is a lot of time the rest of the Torah from Exodus on is about 120 years give or take or at least after the first portion of Shemot it already you know from where Moses is born till he dies 120 years and he's born in the first portion of Exodus so we're gonna see that we'll get to it but for those of you who are online I know you don't have these handouts these magnificent handouts. So we're going to be going through these handouts. Here you go. Um, and for those of you who would like a copy, uh, you're welcome to email me and I will happily send it to you in a PDF. Um, my email is awolbe at torchweb.org. awolbe at torchweb.org. Looking forward to seeing your email. Okay, so the book of Bereshus. We gave an introduction last week. We spoke about the fundamentals of what is the Torah, what kind of book is it, um, the structure of the, the what we know as the or, or the written Torah versus the oral Torah. We went through we went through this magnificent um, uh, uh, pyramid and understanding that the the Ten Commandments. The written Torah, which comprises of three different sections, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Prophets, and the Ketuvim, the Writings. And that's a total of 24 books that we have. And then we have the Oral Torah, which is the Mishnah, the Midrash, the Kabbalah, the Talmud, etc. And then we have the Halacha. The Halacha is, what do we actually do? And everything in Halacha, there's nothing that's written in Halacha that is not sourced in a higher source in a Talmud discussion, conclusion, and backed up in the Mishnah, sourced in the Torah, sources in the written Torah. So everything needs to work its way up the pyramid in order to be validated. There's not an extra letter in the Torah. The Torah is concise on every single letter. Literally, every single letter is there for a special purpose. There's no letter. Even though it might seem like this is just ordinary, it's not ordinary. It's there for a very special purpose. Okay, so now... We're going to start with Bereshis. Bereshis, as we mentioned last week, is the book of Genesis. And this book is focused on the family of Israel. Okay? All of the fundamentals of Judaism. So we're going to start the first two portions. Is 20 generations. Two portions. 20 generations. And 2,023 years, as you see in your notes. 2,023 years. We have the six days of creation. The, the Torah begins with the six days of creation. Now, day one, heaven and earth, light separated between light and dark. Day two, God fixed the skies. Day three, the grass and the trees. Day four, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies. Day five, the birds and the fish. And day six, animals, Adam and Eve. Now, you may be uh, watching the History Channel, and they're going to be doing some documentaries saying how the world is uh, who knows how many billions of years old. And then you come to synagogue, and they say, oh, it's Rosh Hashanah, year 5779, and next year is going to be 5780. And you'd be like, what's wrong with these Jews? Obviously, uh, science and Judaism doesn't match up. That's incorrect. All right? And we have many scientists, Jewish scientists and non-Jewish scientists as well, who will confirm the following. We, in Judaism, only count time from the creation of Adam and Eve. Our time begins from them. Till then, it was just getting everything in order for them. They were the last creation. The last creation is what the creation, all of creation, was made for. Contrary to some some uh, groups may want you to think that it's all for the, for, the, uh, for the animals 
and it's all for the um, for the uh, for the uh, for the sea animals. And you have many people who have different ideas of what the world was created for. The world was created for mankind. And the simplest, obvious uh, proof to that is that, you know, if you were to invite guests to your house, what would you do? You'd invite the guests, they come, and then you start cooking. Or you'd cook, right? You'd invite them, cook, and then when they're when they're when everything is ready, that's when they come, right? You schedule it so that everything is ready for when they come, for when they arrive. God set the table for Adam, the last creation, right? Sof ma'ase The end of creation was the beginning of God's intention. God created the world, everything that that comes into the world all the way so that Adam and Eve and mankind can have what they need. Okay. There's another couple of interesting, important points. I mean, we talk about creation. It's not a simple uh, discussion. I'll tell you that there's a great rabbi who wrote, I mentioned this, who wrote a book about the, the uh, seven days, six days of creation. And he came for an approbation to a great rabbi to write, you know, write him like, yeah, this is a good book, uh, you know, I learned so much from it, and you'll surely gain tremendous... Right? The rabbi wrote nothing. He says, I, I can't give you an approbation. He says, why not? I says, I spent 25 years writing this book. He says, 25 years on creation? That's nothing. What's 25 years? Right? You don't even scratch the surface in 25 years to try to understand the secrets of... of... Now, we, in our breakneck through the Bible class, have spent six months on creation learning through the commentaries understanding all the depths that we were able to get to in six months that's nothing to understand creation so we run through it oh what what happened each day heaven earth light dark yeah yeah right we were talking about worlds of wisdom that goes into each one of them okay I don't want to get delve into too much because this is a crash course. In the break next to the Bible, we get much more, much deeper into it. So we're just going to stick. If there are any specific questions, you can ask them, but only if they're on the topic that we're actually discussing. So day number seven is the day of rest. Hashem rests. Now, we have to understand that the most genius creation that Hashem created is the day of Shabbos. The day of Shabbos is putting things into perspective. We mentioned this a little bit yesterday in our Musar Monday class, that we need to take time off to evaluate if we're heading in the right direction. You see, we can work six days a week, work all day, all night, all day, all night, and then we don't take a break on Shabbos. We could be heading in the wrong direction. We don't realize what way we're going because we're so busy. Shabbos is a time where God says this every single week, take time to evaluate take time to spend time with your family spend time with the Almighty go visit your neighbors go visit your friends and you're all welcome to our neighborhood uh, where I live and uh, you'll see that you know with the serenity of Shabbos that comes in when you light the candles you have you start seeing children running you know up and down the streets and you see the the, the mothers walking with strollers and all the men are going to shul and coming from shul it's like the old shtetl Right? That's, that, that's what Shabbos is supposed to be like. At the time, everyone gets together, and you have Kiddush together, and you eat Shalant and Kugel and all the other wonderful delicacies. The idea of Shabbos is much more than just a day off, a day to relax. It's much more. To the point where it says in the Orachayim that Shabbos, when we welcome in the Shabbos, what do we sing? We sing Shalom Aleichem. We welcome in the angels. And we say, Boachem, your coming should be with blessing. And Baruchuni, bless us, bless our home. And then what do we say? Tzedchem, goodbye. Now you can leave. Angels, you can leave. And he asks, why, why are we telling the angels to leave? We just, we just welcome them into our home. We just ask them for blessings. And now we're saying, okay, goodbye. Baruchayim says an amazing idea. He says, because the Jewish people are elevated, their soul is elevated to such a high plane on Shabbos, that the angels can't handle it. They can't handle the high level of spirituality that we attain on Shabbos. So it's for their benefit we're sending them away. Now the angels we know are very special. 
True, but not as special as human beings. Not as special as human beings who are able to not only grow, but who are also able to fall. Angels can't fall. Angels can't grow. They are who they are. Human beings have the ability to go up and to go down and to go up and to go down. That's what makes us great. That's what makes us holy. Even the angels can't grasp onto Shabbos. Shabbos is a day of absolute serenity. At least it should be. A day of connection. Okay? So, Shabbos is a day of rest. We talk about the Garden of Eden. This is all in the first portion of Bereshit. Now, the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Knowledge, and there's so much to talk about the Tree of Knowledge. Um, it's, like, you know, it's funny because we learn so many things in, in, in grade school about the Tree of Knowledge and what happened in the Garden of Eden, most of which is inaccurate. And we go with that thought for the rest of our lives thinking this is what's accurate. Again, we spent a lot of time discussing what was that Tree of, of, of Knowledge, you know, why um, it doesn't really tell us where it's located. It says that it's in the mirror. Well, we can get into, into, into all of this on an, in another class, but there's a lot to learn about this. All in the first portion, we have appreciation. Now, I heard an incredible idea several years ago, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it was a great rabbi. He was visiting Houston, and he said the following idea. He said, Why were Adam and Eve punished? Why were they punished? Because we know because they ate from the tree of knowledge, right? Yeah. He says like this. He said a brilliant idea. He said because they lacked appreciation. He says all of our prayer that we have today is appreciation. It's to fix and repair the appreciation that Adam and Eve didn't succeed with in the Garden of Eden. All of our existence is to show that appreciation. If you think about it, all of our prayer is saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a novel, brilliant idea. And I asked him for the source. I said, can you just share with me the source? He says, source? Common sense. He says, what else would they be thrown out for? Right? All right, we have to find our source for it as well. But the idea is that appreciation is the most important tool that we need to acquire in our lifetime to properly appreciate the people around us to properly appreciate our spouse to appreciate our neighbors to appreciate our parents to appreciate the world we live in yes how could they appreciate something if they knew nothing else. Oh, oh, oh. How so, could so, they do that so, if right, they right. had no knowledge that's, of good and evil? That, that's, that's a very good question. All right, Questions don't necessarily need to be answered in this class, but it's a great question. I love the question. Right? We'll, we'll talk about it offline. The next important, very important message that we need to take from this whole story of Adam and Eve is the greatest gift God gave mankind, <clears throat> and that is free will. God gave us free will, the ability to choose. Right? You can choose to, do, to go right, to go left, to go up, to go down. You can choose almost any choice that comes your way. You have the freedom to choose. Now, some things are not your choice. Right? You want to become an Olympic swimmer? Probably not a choice anymore. Right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ruling it out, Stuart. Okay? It's possible. Not likely. Right? right now, that's not a choice that you're given. Right? So, yeah, we have free will, but there are limits to that free will. Okay? But for God to create a world where there is incredible accountability for the choices that we make. There's nothing that gets thrown under the, under the rug. And God gives us the ability to choose our path. God gives everything. It's such an... Think about it. It's not Iran. Iran, if you steal, you only do it once because you lose your hands. So you'll never steal again. Now, something very interesting happens in the beginning of the Torah. The first time God's name is mentioned in the Torah, it says, Bereshit bara elo kim. In the beginning, God, right? 
The word Elohim, the name of God, Elohim, I'm saying a kuf with, in, instead of a hey, not to say God's name in vain. It could have said Hashem with a different, a different, a different pronunciation. It says Elohim. What is Elohim? It's judgment. judgment. It's the element of judgment. <clears throat> and then it goes over. The next time it says Hashem. So Rashi immediately jumps on this. The common, great commentator Rashi. And Rashi says, Allah In the beginning, God intended for the world to be ruled in judgment. Meaning, you steal, your hand gets chopped off. But God saw that the world can't survive like that. So he incorporated kindness in the world. But really, ultimately, he wanted the world to be functioning as a place of judgment. That means accountability, a place of responsibility, right? It's an interesting idea. We'll talk about it more um, uh, over, over the coming weeks. We're actually going to be uh, advertising some of the classes we're doing, Shavuot, on the all-night learning. And this is actually one of the topics we're going to be discussing um, in those classes. So we'll get to it. Uh, we, the, the Torah tells us further about the serpent's enticement. We see also reward and punishment. This is a theme that's very, very important to see throughout the Torah. We see the concept of reward and punish. Those who did good got rewarded. Those who did bad got punished. We see it with Cain and Abel. We see it with Noah and the flood. We see it with the Tower of Babel. We see it with Abraham. We see it with Sodom and Gomorrah. We see it with Isaac. We see it with Ishmael. We see it with, with Jacob. We see it with Esau. We see it with, with the tribes. We see it with Joseph. You see it with Moses. You see it with Aaron. Throughout the Torah, you always see one after another after another. You see instances where accountability was put into play. You did the right thing, you got, you got rewarded. You did the wrong thing, you got punished. Now, the punishment wasn't necessarily immediate. And God always waits for us to, do, to, to repent. That doesn't either happen necessarily immediately. We don't always realize that we did something wrong. Sometimes it takes, it takes a few minutes till, someone, till you realize that you did something wrong. Sometimes it takes for someone to, to come back to you and tell you, you know, you did something 20 years ago when we were in high school and uh, it really hurt me. And, and, you know, you can continue the drama yourself, right? But the idea is sometimes you don't even know that you did something wrong. God waits. God is patient. God is forgiving. But there is this concept of reward and punishment. There's no one, no one in the world who got away with a freebie. Like imagine you walk into a hotel, you check into your hotel room, and you're like, oh, today's my lucky day. You open up the fridge and you see it's packed with little whiskey, sh whiskey shots. There, they have cookies and you have uh, chocolate bars and you have all these things stocked. You're like, wow, it's amazing. So you start munching on them one after another, after another, after another, right? Eventually you check out from your vacation and what happens? They give you this huge bill. You're like, what's this? I'm like, what do you mean? You ate from the bar. This world is the same. We come into this world, it's a hotel. God gives us unbelievable opportunity, but there's a price to pay. There's a price. God says, I'm giving you all the pleasure. By, by the way, just so that you understand, Judaism is obsessed with happiness. Okay? We are obsessed with happiness in Judaism. You see this throughout the Torah. The Torah was given so that we can enjoy, we can take pleasure in it, not to suffer. It's not a bunch of rules. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. That's not what the Torah is here for. The Torah is here for us to derive pleasure from it. That is the purpose. But, what is pleasure? Oh, that's a whole different discussion, right? Some define pleasure as base, bottom of the barrel pleasures. Some are talking about upper level, upper tier, elite, first class pleasure. That's what the Torah tells us to invest in. The Torah says don't waste time with lower class, baggage level, uh, you know, uh, what do they call that? Ultimate economy? 
or no. loser economy, right? What do they call it? You can't even breathe economy. Basic, yeah, basic economy, right? Right? And then there's economy, and then there's okay, enough feet so that you can <laughs> twist yourself into a pretzel economy. And then you have business class, and you have first class, and you have, you know, you can sit in the cockpit and you can go into the upper duper class up in the in the right. So you have all these different levels. We understand that they're you, they're all getting to the same destination. Right, but it's a different way in which you in the, Judaism is all about upper class pleasure. All right? And you can see how the who in the world is invested in what pleasures to understand what the Almighty wants us to be to be busy with. But either way, we have a world which is here for us to enjoy. God wants us to enjoy. It's actually very interesting. If you think of the first thing God told Adam, what's the first thing God told Adam? 99.9% .9 of people will tell you God said, don't eat from that tree. Wrong. Go, no. No, you can eat from you all the You can eat, trees exactly. Except. You can eat from everything. Enjoy everything. This one tree, don't. The, what God wants us is to, from us is to enjoy. Enjoy this world. There are some limitations. There are some things you cannot do. Why can we not do certain things? So that we can enjoy the things we do. So, you understand that there has to always be a balance between the pleasure that we do enjoy and we do indulge in, like the Torah wants us to, like God wants us to, and those that we do not. Okay? So, this, re this concept of reward and punishment is so fundamental. It is so fundamental for us to understand that the... the um, the, the Torah is not about, you know, if, just look, look, look how beautiful it is. Look how beautiful it is. Who does the Torah invest all of its time in? It doesn't dwell so much about the people who were evil in Noah's time. It doesn't invest so much of talking about the Tower of Babel and those people, or the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, or even the people of Egypt. It doesn't talk about them. Very little bit of verse 2, 3. Esau, we give him a, a mention at the end of a portion. We say, oh, by the way, he had these grandchildren, those grandchildren, those grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Okay, and that's it. Goodbye. You see what they talk about Jacob? Look how much we have dedicated to Jacob. And to his children? Esau, we have a little. <laughs> Why? God writes about what he's proud of. He writes about what's important. And what's important is not the evildoers. Not those who invest their life in base pleasures, in lower level pleasures. Those who are invested in the upper upper class pleasures. Okay, so we have reward and punishment. We have the story of Cain and Abel. Cain is cursed and protected. We have the 10 generations that pass. And then we have the wickedness and sin in the land. And we have a very important question that we need to address, okay? Uh, I may have mentioned this in previous weeks, but we, we, we discussed why, why in the world is the Torah punishing people like we're going to see soon in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the flood, Noah's flood. Why are they being punished? They were never warned. Common sense. Right? There we go. Very good. So we mentioned this la last class in the introduction. And we have to understand there's a very, very big fundamental principle in the Torah. Okay, we all know there's a, there's, there's a, there's a great principle, right? If you have uh, little children running around your house, right, and there's something you don't want them to do, what will you tell them? Listen here. Mommy or Daddy or pop, Poppy or whatever name you call yourself, right? You tell them these are the rules, okay? You can play with all, the, all your toys, and you can, but... This you cannot do, whatever it is, right? You can't open this closet, you can't take ice cream, whatever it is that you want them to, right? and you, you warn them, so now they know. You come into the, into the kitchen three minutes later and they're pounding that ice cream you told them not to eat. Will you give them a punishment? Most likely, why? Because you gave them a warning, right? If you drive on the road and there is no speed limit, you will not get pulled over for speeding. Why? 
because you were never warned. Or if you do, you'll be able to argue in court that the speed limit sign was not there. Because we all understand that you cannot punish unless you are warned. Okay? So, where is the warning? We don't get the Torah till the middle of Exodus. We still didn't get the Torah till the middle of Exodus. We go over here to the fifth portion in Exodus. That's when we get the Torah. And that's 2,500 years in. 2,500 years in. So those 2,500 years, where's the warning? Well, God was talking to these people. So, uh, they still know. They don't have a document. They don't have rules. They don't have instructions. Nowhere does it say thou shalt not murder. Cain kills his brother. Okay, now what? Why is he punished? So our sages tell us, we have a special gift. It's at the highest point of a human body. It's called a brain. Okay? That brain is not just so that we can... Uh, uh, do arithmetic and, and, and figure out uh, equations and, 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 and memorize things. That's not why we have a brain. We have a brain to use common sense. That's why God gave us a brain. Common sense. We all know the basics. The basics are don't murder, don't steal, and that we don't have a Torah to tell us that. That we all know on our own. But it does mention it in the Ten Commandments, right? It does say that in the Ten Commandments. True. And that's because if you look at the commentaries, the commentaries will tell you that do not murder, do not steal, doesn't mean the murder and steal that we know with our own common sense. With our own common sense, we know that you don't stab and shoot someone to death. And you don't go and steal someone's Rolex. We know that from common sense. The Torah doesn't tell us that. The Torah doesn't need to tell us that. So why does it tell us do not murder in the Ten Commandments? That's because do not murder written in the Torah is telling you not to embarrass someone in public. It's like spilling their blood. It's equivalent to the murder you know from common sense. Do not steal is a different type of stealing. Either it means kidnapping or other, according to other commentaries it means not stealing someone's intellect which is parallel to the common sense stealing of not stealing someone's watch, not stealing someone's car. That's common sense. We all know that. The Torah doesn't teach us common sense. And the punishment of Noah and his generation, and the Tower of Babel, and all of, all of the punishments we see are common sense mistakes they made. And they're, they're accountable for it. Even though there was no Torah, there's no warning that's necessary for something which is common sense. Okay. So, that concludes the first portion of the Torah. Congratulations, everybody. Okay? First portion of the Torah. Second portion is Noach. Now, just so that you remember this, this is a, 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 a memory tool that I, I learned from Rabbi Avraham Goldhar, where he says um, there are 12 portions in Genesis, 11 portions in Exodus, 10 in Leviticus, 10 in Numbers, and 11 in Deuteronomy. 12, 11, 10, 10, 11. Okay? 12, 11, 10, 10, 11. Right? I wake you up in the morning, I'm like, hey, hey, how many, how many, how many parshas are in the Torah? 12, 11, 10, 10, 11. Right? Okay? Remember that. So, there are 12 portions in Genesis, and the second of those 12 is Noah, Parshas Noah. Noah was righteous. He contributed morality to the world. But, what was his... What was his flaw? His flaw was that he didn't do outreach. What's the difference between Abraham and Noah? They were both righteous. But Rashi, Rashi jumps on the words of the Torah in his commentary and says, why does it say Noah was righteous in his generation? Because had he been in the generation of Abraham, Abraham went out and he went to, to spread the word of God. Noah is like, I, I'm just going to stay out of trouble. I'm going to stay out of trouble. So, he contributed mor morality to the, to the world, but he didn't do outreach. He didn't go out and convince people, you know what, you're doing terrible things. Let's correct our ways. God's going to bring a flood. 120 years it took him to build a, a, an ark. 120 years. That's a lot of time to tell people, you know, it's time to shape up. 
God's going to bring a flood. Instead, he was like, okay, I'm just going to do my thing. Right? Do, right? He built an ark. Now, our sages tell us that the ark that Noah built is an ark for us to use in as, as an example for ourselves. Where we're living in a world which is flooded with immorality. We need to build our own ark, and that's our own homes. Our own homes, we need to invest in making sure that what we have in our home is spirituality. The world out there is all physical. The world out there is all indulging in all types of um, physical, materialistic pleasures. What's a, a, a godly life? One that's not only utilizing materialistic and physical pleasures for their spiritual growth, Right? That means we don't just have materialism and physical uh, tools. We use them as a way for us to grow spiritually. You know, it's, it's interesting uh, in, in, um, in, in Catholicism, right? So the priests don't marry, right? They have celibacy and they don't, they don't marry on the books, right? Let's not get into any of that, right? But, right, so they... they they don't get married. In Judaism, it's, we have a very different approach. Now, why don't they get married? It makes a lot of sense, in a way, in a very shallow way. Why don't they get married? They don't get married because if you want to live a spiritual life, you have to completely remove yourself from a physical life. You can't have both, either physical or spiritual. That's their perspective. What's our perspective? No. You, you, you take the physical and you elevate it and make it spiritual. There's nothing physical that we can't make spiritual. Food. Food is a very physical, very common addiction that people have. Food. You know what? What do we do with our food? We use it as a tool to connect to the Almighty. We say a blessing. Enjoy the food. Indulge in the food. But before you put one morsel of food in your mouth, you say, thank you, Hashem. So now this food isn't just physical food. It has become spiritual food because it became a vessel through which you connected with the Almighty. So it's not anymore pizza. Now it became a tool for your connection with Hashem. It's a, it's a, it's a very, you understand? We take the physical and elevate it. We make it spiritual. That's the contrast we need to understand between Noach's, uh, Noach's ark. It was a world that's all flooded with all of these things. We need to build our own ark. We need to build our own existence that's not based on that form of physicality. We have to blend the two together. He gathered one set of all non-kosher animals and seven sets of kosher animals. And he brought them all in to the, into, the, uh, into the ark, and there was the great flood. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and it took one year for the water to recede. Noach brings offerings to God as thanks for saving his family. And then we have the seven Noachite laws. Before we, before we continue, I just want to talk a little bit about this. So first is one of the important lessons that the Torah tells us. It says that, um, first is, how did he know already what's kosher or what's not kosher, right? The Torah yet wasn't given. Right? It wasn't given yet. So how does, how does Noach know? So we have to understand that the Torah, pre, the Torah precedes the world. And we mentioned this last class. The Torah is the blueprint for the world. In that blueprint, it tells you what animal is kosher and what animal is not kosher. Okay? So, God communicating with, with Noah is teaching him that. is telling him what is and what isn't. Now, there's a there are a couple of important things here. First is, we see what it means to have clean speech. The Torah doesn't use a, uh, a, uh, a terminology. It's used for the pure animals, for the kosher animals, it says for those that are pure, and it doesn't say for those that are foul, for those that are disgusting, for those that are putrid. It doesn't talk about any of those. You know what it says? For those that are not pure. 
It uses a clean language. And it's what the Torah, one of the lessons the Torah teaches us, to use a clean language. When we talk, we shouldn't say words that are inappropriate. Even the Torah uses extra words instead of just saying, you know, for, for the disgusting animals, right? No, 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 no. It says for those that aren't kosher, for those that aren't pure. It uses more words to tell us the importance of using proper language. Okay. It rains. It rains for 40 days. Now, being that this is a summary class, ooh, being that this is a summary class, I'm just going to very quickly talk about this. The number 40, all numbers have great power. The number 40 has phenomenal power and that the number 40 means something. Number seven, we know, means something. Number number eight, number two, all, all numbers mean great things. They have great powers in Judaism. It's not just random. We have in our magnificent Levin, Levitt Family Library, we have over here a book on numbers, right? Up in shel 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 shelf number 11. Um, you can look at it after class. We have a whole book on Jewish numbers. But the number 40, what's special about the number 40? So let's take, take a couple of things that have to do with the number 40. So we know 40 is the, the amount of days that it rained in the flood, right? It rained, rained 40 days and 40 nights. We know that Moses went up to up the mountain. He was there for 40 days, 40 nights. We know the Jewish people were in the desert for 40 years. We know that gestation is 40 weeks. We know that a baby is considered living after 40 days in by Jewish law, right? Actually, now the whole argument that they're having now in the courts in some of some of the states about the heartbeat law if you're familiar that as soon as the baby has a heartbeat it's considered living you know what when that begins let me hear 40 exactly <laughs> six weeks all right 41 42 days right it's 40 days how many uh how many there's many other things that are 40 but i'll just go jump to, to the last yes about 40 inches of rain in Houston. Oh, that's right. It was actually 51, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but there's also Rabbi the... Rabbi Akiva started learning at the age of 40? Yes, that's correct. The Rabbi Akiva started to learn at the age of 40. And we also have that in a mikvah, there's a quantity of water that is called 40 se'ah. That's the quantity that's required for a mikvah to be kosher. We also see the number of 40 from the beginning of the month of Elul through Yom Kippur. What is this with this number 40? So our sages tell us, 40 is the number of creation. It's to become a new creation, you have the number 40. Gestation, obvious, right? Becomes a new baby. You have, um, you have the, 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 uh, the mikvah. Someone goes in impure, comes out, pure. They become a new person. You have the number 40 associated with it. Noah, God says, this world is evil. I need to start over again. To, re to have a rebirth of this world, you have the number 40. The Jewish people leave Egypt. They're slaves. You know how you get a new mentality? 40 years in the desert. Moses goes up to receive the Torah, to be worthy of it. You need his 40 days. All the numbers 40. Rabbi Akiva, it was a new, he became a new person at the age of 40. Right? The idea here is that it's, it's a very powerful idea. 40 is a new beginning. You, you can, it's a rebirth, a recreation. Here is where Noah and his, and his uh, generation had an opportunity to start over again. Now, I'm jumping to the back over here where I have my appendix, right? And I'm just going to read some of the the, the next. Uh, uh, so we have the next on our list here is the seven Noachide laws. Noach is commanded by God to obey the following seven laws. Number one, Aver Minachai, which is forbidden. We're forbidden to eat a limb or meat removed from a live animal. Okay, you can't chop off a leg, throw it on the grill, right? It has to be slaughtered. This is for non-Jews. This is for non-Jews. Any, any. Gentile who wants to get their way into heaven, you don't have to believe in Judaism. You have to f obey these seven laws. By the way, we're the only religion that's that generous. 
right? <laughs> and the, all the other ones is eternal damnation. You don't believe in our Lord and Savior. The other one, you're an infidel. You, we give you, we wage jihad against you. Chop, chop, right? You're all over, right? It's all over. Judaism? No, you, on the contrary, you come to convert. What do we say? Nah, I don't think it's a good idea. You, you can go. You can leave now, right? No, no, I really want to. Are you crazy? Right? And we, we keep on going. Do you know how much matzah costs? Right? <laughs> Gefilte fish is not our attractive, uh, you know. Right. right, okay, so we have, so number one is forbid, we're forbidden to eat a limb or meat removed from a live animal. Number two is for, we're forbidden to curse Hashem. Blasphemy, right? Birkat Hashem. Number three is we're forbidden to steal or rob. Gezel. Number four, we're forbidden to commit adultery. Number five, it's Gilui Arayot. Number five is forbidden to murder a fellow man, Shvichat Dam. And then we have number six, it is obligatory to appoint judges and set up courts, so to have a legal system, and that din. And then number seven is we're forbidden to worship idols. Anywhere here that we have to believe in Hashem? No? Anywhere here, now we're talking about the, the nations of the world. Anywhere here that we have to, you know, uh, convert to the doctrines of Jewish belief? No. Blessings before we eat? No. Seven off, I'd lost. Now, it's Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Gimel, Dalet, Dalet, Zion. Okay? Aleph is for Eber Menachai, not to eat a limb from a live animal. Bet, not to curse Hashem, Birkat Hashem. Gimel, Gazel, which is not to steal. Gilui Arayot, not to have adultery, not to commit adultery. Shvichot Damim, which is with a Dalit, is not to murder. Din, which is justice, to have laws. And then Zayin, Avodah Zara, not to serve idolatry. Okay, those are the seven Noahide laws. Let's continue. God, God made new, a new covenant with mankind. He made, gave us a rainbow. Now, what's interesting about a rainbow, the Midrash tells us the rainbow is, is what? It's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a good sign. It, well, it's not a good sign. It means that God wanted to really destroy the world at that time, but he's keeping his promise. But a rainbow is also something very, very, very special. If you look at a rainbow and I tell you, point at the red. Ah, oh, I, can't, I can't really point on that because the red, it's such a perfect blend of colors that it's all enmeshed one into the other. And that the reason why specifically the rainbow was chosen is because God says, I'm weaving myself in with mankind. You're not going to be able to say anymore, that's Hashem. That's, that, the, it's going to be blended in in a way that's going to be more difficult for us to discern God's presence. It's going to be more difficult for us to discern, right? God is blending in sort of like the, like the colors of the rainbow. Then we have the beginning of the 70 nations. They were unified sinners. They traveled to the Valley of Shinar to build a huge tower of Babel against God. God confuses them with the 70 languages. And uh, imagine you're telling the guy, you know, pass me another brick, pass me another brick. And suddenly you talk to the guy and he's like, ¿Qué pasó? Right? <laughs> he's like, ¿Shto, shto te Right? And the next guy's like, Alo, mako repo. Right? Each one is speaking in a different language. Nobody knows what's going on. It's total chaos. So they went to the east, and they went to the west, and they went to the north, and they went to the south, and they went here, and they went there. Everyone went to 70 nations. That's the 70 nations that, that we currently have today. Ten more generations pass from Noah to Abraham, and we know that Abraham ends the second portion of the Torah by destroying all the idols. Now, I need to just tell you that we have over here in our appendix as well, um, the 20 generations from Adam all the way till uh, Abraham. Okay, it's Adam to Shaste, Seth, to Enosh, which is uh, Hanoch, to Canaan, to Mahalalel, to Yered, to Hanoch, to Mesushalach, Lemech, and Noach. That's 10. Then we have Noach, to Shem, to Ar Arpachshad, Shelach, Ever, Peleg, Reu, Surug, Nahor, Terach, and then Avraham, which is another 10. And each one, the year I have, we have over here in the back, God willing, we'll print it out at the end of the course for everyone. You have the year they were born, you have the year they died, and the actual age that they lived. Okay, 
So now comes the interesting part of the Torah. Obviously, every part of the Torah is interesting. It's a, the less cryptic part of the Torah. Because the, the part of creation, it's interesting, I mentioned this in a, in a different class, but I, th I think it's, it's, it's a thousand percent accurate and true. It's very interesting that you'll never find a full week preceding the portion of Bereshit. Usually you have a full week to prepare for the portion, right? Bereshit, never. Genesis, the beginning of the Torah, never. You have Simchat Torah on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Shabbat. You're like, you, you never have a full week. So my father, may he live and be well, he said this following idea, I think it's, it's brilliant. He says, because Genesis is the secrets of creation, it's the secrets of godliness. God doesn't want us delving in it. God doesn't want us dealing with all of the, the, the Kabbalistic realms. of God wants us living our lives, connecting to Him, enjoying the pleasures that God gave us in this world to connect to Him. Not to be busy with all of these, these the secrets of creation. That's, that's not... The, just go do the mitzvahs. Go, go learn the Torah, right? Don't be busy with creation. There's other things, that, you know... And I think it's very, it's very interesting that the 2,023 years in two portions, boom, done. Now from here, from the beginning of Lech Lecha, the third portion, all the way to the end of the 12th portion, the Vayichi, the end of the book of, excuse me, the book of Genesis, is 286 years. That's it. It's an amazing. This is not a history book. Either way. The book of Lech Lecha begins in these three portions. Lech Lecha, Vayera, and Chayisara are dealing with the life of Abraham. Okay? So, Lech Lecha begins as follows. Abraham discovers God. Uh, monotheism. Now, the story is told that Abraham's father um, got an invitation to go to Vegas to the, uh, to the idolatry uh, convention and to look at the, the expo of all of the different idols that he can add to his shop. And he tells Abraham, he says, if you, don't, if you don't mind, can you just do me a favor and just, you know, keep, keep on top of my, uh, my idolatry store, right? It was like this big Costco for idolatry, <laughs> right? And no problem. Abraham says, no problem. And... Um, Tarachko. Right. <laughs> yeah. Tarachko. And uh, he goes, his father travels and goes to this conference and comes back and all of the, all of the, the idols are all cracked and broken and his father comes in and says well, what happened here he says oh you you would not believe it you would not believe it right he says this guy said he's God this guy said he's God and they started beating each other up and this one cracked his 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 him in the waist and that one he said they were going nuts they were, you have no idea this was a madhouse until I was able to get things under control right he says what are you talking about these are just right they don't talk they don't move he says and you believe that these are gods Right? The, 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 this is what's God? This? So, Abraham discovered God. Now, how did Abraham discover God? It's a whole nother class. We can spend many, many hours dis discussing that. But here, Abraham discovers God. He, he, the idea of monotheism is Abraham's idea. And God calls Abraham at the age of 75 years, years old. Abraham and Sarah traveled. Abraham marries Sarah, and they travel to Egypt. Sarah is barren. They return to the promised land. God tells them, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this land." Um, Abraham and Lot part ways. Didn't work out so well. Um, that the, that uncle nephew partnership. Uh, God repeats the, his promise of the land. The war of kings. We know that there was the war of the kings, four kings versus the five kings. God reassures Abraham. You have Hagar and Yishmael. You have the covenant with God. You have new names that are given to Abraham and to Sarah. Abraham goes from Abram to Abraham. He gets a hey. And Sarai gets a hey. Instead of the Yud, she becomes Sarah. Right? Abraham is commanded to circumcise himself. And the promise to Sarah for her offspring is given at the end of the parsha of Lech Lecha. Okay? Um, I think we're running a little bit long here, so we're going to end here. We're going to continue next week by the portion of Vayera. I'm going to mark my notes here. 
And to all of our friends online, we hope you enjoyed this. You're welcome to come here live in the classroom. We're wonderful people here. And uh, very comfortable cheers, by the way. These are fantastic cheers. Uh, very comfortable. We always have delicious coffee and, uh, and or espresso and snacks usually. Um, and uh, if we don't run out, and M&Ms, of course. Uh, and just the really lovely, lovely people here. So uh, to our friends online, come join us. And if you can't, then at least like the video and share it with your friends online. Thank you so much. Have a terrific evening. And we're looking forward to seeing you at part three of the Torah Crash Course next week at 8 p.m. Thank you and have a terrific evening, everybody.